Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Inquisitive Room Podcast. It's Shaw here. I'm your host, and I'm glad that you joined me today. I do hope you stick around. If you're new here and you're just joining us, listen to the older podcast, and I do hope that you stick around. Today, I've got a, a very exciting guest. Exciting for me because we're going to talk about neuroscience. And I certainly am interested in all science, but specifically in neuroscience. Dr. Jaya Viswanthanen is a neuroscientist. She's also an engineer and she was raised in India. She is an artist as well and an author and she illustrates images for her book, Baby Senses, which is a sensory neuroscience primer for all ages. She makes neuroscience accessible. She makes it fun. She makes it intellectually, I suppose, accessible and grasping for all audiences, for lay audiences. And she also has an engineering degree. She's got a master's in neuroscience and a doctorate in cognitive neuroscience. We talk about how she got interested in neuroscience, because when you're looking at studying, and she, she has an engineering degree, what drew her towards neuroscience? So she talks about that, and also about her research experience, because it's different for everyone. In her free time, she volunteers as a STEM, which is a science, technology, engineering, art, and math tutor. She loves art, and she paints every week, and she, she's joined a, a, a painting group that she attends every week. And she does a lot of research still. She's connected to a lot of different organizations which support research. Learning science can be fun. And I don't know what it was like for you growing up or at school, but a lot of children are fascinated by science. And a lot of them just don't get it. And I think that's intrinsic. I think it's uh, nurture and nature. But I also think we're born with different gifts. I talk about this in all my podcasts. But that's my belief system. And I asked Jaya about that as well. She's fascinating. And she's so passionate about the topic, about her work. And we all have strengths. Um, and we, we really interesting. We talk about various animals that share our planet with us. We all share this beautiful planet. And she, she gives some brilliant examples of what some animals can do that is really mind blowing, extraordinary. And human beings have extraordinary gifts as well. Um, but we're still learning. And I think one thing we do agree on is that, you know, research has to be it has to continue we have to keep learning we have to keep exploring we have to keep challenging we must keep experimenting it's always about the experiment we have made some inroads and jaya does talk a lot about uh, fmri and we talk a bit more about how it's helping uh, how it's growing and also she gives some examples of you know her own work and how that's helping people as well and you know Science, it can be philosophical, it can be arty as well. So she she takes us through all of those nuances about science and in particular about neuroscience. And being exposed very early on uh, to science and it can help. She talks about how if, if children are, if it's approached, if your teacher is helpful, excited, passionate about a topic, it, it can be infectious. And I think we've all had somebody uh, at some point uh, be very, very passionate about something. It makes you want to either emulate it or champion it. And some people want to emulate things they can't do, <laughs> but some people are inspired and maybe go off into their own uh, path or go out on their own path and try something that they're actually interested in. But what the common denominator can be is the passion, the encouragement. So she does mentor, she helps a lot of people, especially children. And she, her book, this book is fantastic. The link will be in the show notes, Baby Senses. And it really is fascinating how she uses art because children are very visual 
and uh, you know to learn about science but art and the imagination and also helps them relate to things that they are aware of which is animals is one of the first things children do become aware of that move and have uh, different personalities I suppose because animals do other than adults and uh, you know there could be an animal in, within the home that could you could meet one on the street so children become very aware of animals and it's all in their literature and children's books there's lots of different representations and cartoons of animals with superpowers and Jai believes that science is our superpower as well and so yeah so we talk a lot about the things that help us to not see science as this mind-boggling exploration of of nothing of a big blob and that there's no it's uh, it's never ending which you know science is never ending really we have to keep it up we have to keep doing it and it's important for our progression and that's how we've gotten to where we are today so without further ado i welcome dr jaya vishwasnathan to the show it's lovely to see you thank you so much for joining me today it's such a pleasure to be here shah thank you so much for having me and i'm just so looking forward to having a conversation with you because i've so enjoyed all the conversations you've had on this podcast before this and i'm just so honored to be um a part of this movement that you've started and and really excited to be here thanks for having me thank you now you're in one of my favorite fields neuroscience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's fascinating absolutely fascinating let's start at the start um yeah what drew you when you were thinking about yeah. what was going to be my speciality what am yeah I do, what drew you to neuroscience yeah, that's a great question, and uh, I think it's uh, it's might be the answer might be a little bit disappointing almost because I started really early. Like I was, you know, a really nerdy kid in school, and then at a certain point, I'm just looking around the playground, and I went, "Why does everybody have a different reaction to the exact same situation?" Because I'm a little bit of a logical person. I would say I'm very much a logical person, actually. But I, I went, okay, so like, why doesn't everyone think like me? Because I'm logical and I you know if Y follows X, then Y should always follow X. And that kind of baffled me. And a really great example of that is schoolyard bullying, right? So like, so so you have the bullies and the bullied. And often you have the bystanders also kind of exhibiting a wide repertoire of behavior. So like one person might go and grab the teacher and try to put an end to it. Another person sits and laughs or enjoys or joins one of the two sides. And then you have others who are like more protectors and they try to step in themselves and like try to de-escalate the issue. So just kind of like seeing that. And I'm like, why? You know, so. I guess I kind of got interested in it from a psychological and theory of mind kind of point of view, which is for those of you who might not be very familiar with theory of mind, it's the idea of thinking about what someone else is thinking, right? So like, you know, the idea that, you know, right now we're having this conversation and what you, Shaw, or you guys, the listeners, are thinking can be completely different from what I'm thinking right now. And that kind of realization, humans have it um, in, in pre-adolescence usually, so around eight-ish, that idea. So, you know, by the time I was 14, I knew that I wanted to pursue a like an understanding of the brain in some form. I knew I wanted to do research uh, and it didn't quite formalize the, the the subjects didn't quite formalize until later through through grad school through my PhD and all of that. But uh, that idea that passion has been driving me the whole time, and I consider myself incredibly lucky because every day since then, 
I wake up and I feel incredibly lucky to be pursuing my first love, if you will, right? Like I get to wake up and do this for a living. Uh, and it doesn't mean I don't have bad days. It, it, obviously, everyone has bad days in life. Uh, but at the same time, that like, oh, my God, I'm so lucky I get to do this thing I love has not gone away for me. Um, yeah. Wow. At 14, that is incredible. Yeah. But it does remind me of some musicians who say, you know, at 12, at 13, I picked up a guitar and I've never put it down. They're 50. Yeah. They're, oh, so, uh, which brings me to the idea of, you know, being a scientist, um, I, I believe it's a gift. I don't, as as we all know, everybody's not yeah. good at maths or science yeah. or whatever, yeah. or even art. And so, yeah. especially such a left brain activity, yeah. everybody's very different. So, mm -hmm. do you think that we're kind of born with that little gift? Because it just has oh, to be. Yeah. You know? Or did you learn that? You had the exper an experience that people. Yeah. Out. But are we yep. learn do we learn it? So, okay, so I, I have to really thank you for this question because it's it's a topic that just absolutely excites and fascinates me. And I think it comes to this idea of the balance between nature versus nurture in a sense. And there's a lot of exciting science going on at the juncture of those um, at the moment. So personally, so it's my opinion, but you know, it's it's a little bit hard to draw the line because I have so many years of research and science experience. So some of it, all, all, like my opinions at this point in this matter are based on at least the science that I've read. It's not a comprehensive understanding, but um, this is what I would say. So I think we're all born with certain probabilities, right? For certain things certain possibilities instead of even saying probabilities and you know that can come even down to things like skin color right so some of it is genetics some of it is um even like a few generations down of genetics there's one paper i read recently where uh unfortunately it's it's a it's a very it, it was a paper about trauma uh, it was a study and they looked at uh, these Yazidi women who had really um, bad trauma during the Iraq offensive and they had all of these. Anyway, so it was particularly to women and then they followed up with first and second generation descendants and they had like some signs of trauma. So it doesn't have to go back like to your ancestors back in Europe or Africa or Asia in my case. Like it just... It's, you know, it can be a few generations, like things like trauma can affect you. So absolutely, there is something to this idea of like, yes, people are born with certain tendencies, right? And then there is also these critical periods, and this is more scientific, as we go through development where exposures make us good at something or bad at something. A great example of that is how we learn language. So uh, there was another study, uh, which is really interesting, where they, um, so about up to six month old babies, up to six months, so like newborns up to six months, if you like play like Japanese and English to them. So the, the reason they did Japanese and English is because the R and, and L sounds are not distinguishable in Japanese, but they're very distinct in English. So they, they play these like speech sounds to, to infants and then the infants are able to differentiate between R and L uh, if they're exposed to Japanese. But after six months, if they're not, then it's very hard for them. But then fast forward, I don't know, as adults, uh, adolescents, adults, if someone now moves to Japan they are able to pick it up and they're living in that inversed, uh, immersed environment. They pick it up, but it takes them a lot longer. Okay, so that's where I think the effect of effort and our determination and our grit comes into play. Um, and, I, I, you know, like, uh, it, you can move to a country and you can decide... I don't really want to learn the language here. I can get by with English. You can get by with English anywhere in the world. 
you don't take the effort, you don't or make the effort, you don't take classes, you don't put in the time to listen to the cadence and the music in the language, you don't pick it up, you can stay for, there for 20 years, nothing happens. And then there's a person who moves to a country and they're like, oh, this language sounds great. I want to learn it. I want to meet locals. I want to learn about their lived experience and see how that might enhance my life. And they just put themselves into that situation and they go to language classes, they meet locals and they pick it up in a year, right? It, and some sounds can be harder than others. It doesn't mean they're experts in a year, but they are definitely able to pick up the basics to have a conversational uh, level within a year. And so, so, you know, there's definitely a balance between, I think, what people are born with and, and what they can strive to do. And, and it's not black and white. And even skin color, um, height is a bit more deterministic, like you are the height you are. But, you know, nutrition can affect height, too. So they're seeing now people are getting taller and taller. And it's mostly because of nutrition. So even that is not like genetically predetermined. And skin color, a good example of how skin color is not fixed is that yes, you know, your you, the the melanin amount that you're born with is predetermined. It, it's based on your parents' genetics and so on. But then, if a light skinned person moves to Africa, um, their skin will <laughs> develop some kind of tanning over time or freckles or some way to try to protect itself from intense sunlight. So someone who's lived in Florida or Ethiopia for, for uh, decades are going to be darker than when they first left their home country. So anyway, so I'll stop. Like, like I said, the question was very exciting for me and I kind of maybe went off into a really detailed answer there, but I, I really believe that, you know, and, and I think for when it comes to human behavior, the implication that I took away is that people underestimate the value of grit and putting yourself into it. And so, like, I can tell you, like, in my family, personally, um, there, we don't really have a background in art, in painting, but I wanted to learn it. And I so when I picked it up, I was already an adult. I was in grad school. And I wanted to try it and I tried it and I fell in love with it. And the only reason I got good at it was so I had a re I had really great teacher. So that's important too to like make sure you get the right source of knowledge, the right, you know, quality of knowledge. My teacher, my, my art teacher is French and she was phenomenal, Sandrine Fuller. And, um, and, 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 so the, the, the source of knowledge has to be good. But, you know, when I started doing it every week, rain or shine or whatever, however much work I had, I would do art for three hours. It wasn't a lot. You know, sometimes it was on the weekend. Sometimes it was on a weekday when I didn't have that much to do uh, the next day. Like, I don't know, like a Tuesday evening or a Wednesday evening from six to nine. I would just sit and paint or do something artistic look at paintings from the greats, see what I liked, see what color compositions drew me. So anyway, so I think there's nothing that if you really want it, that you can, you, and you put your real, like not just saying I want it, but like put the work behind it, you are going to eventually get good at it. Wow. You know what? That is so fascinating. I hadn't thought about, and the research you mentioned as well, the language part, that is yeah. fascinating. Yeah, because some people just will never pick up languages. Mm -hmm. No matter how we, you, you see them struggle. Mm -hmm. And and maybe you, you might think, okay, that's not, they're not trying, but some of them really are trying. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. They just don't get it. And right. Yeah. And that's a really great point. So I sorry, I didn't mean to mean to skim that part and very, very important point. So thank you for reminding me. Um, I think the other thing that we forget is that not everybody is the same kind of learner. Mm -hmm. Right. So some people are more visual, some people are auditory, some people are tactile. And I think our education system has conveniently often forget forgotten that. I, I say often because 
most countries, not all countries. Um, and and so I think it's also useful for for us as humans to reflect what kind of learning really works for me and try to figure that out. And then once you hit on that, picking it up will be easier. So I had a friend who told me that the way that, so this was when I was in France, uh, a friend who told me that the way they learn English was every morning while they would make their coffee and have their breakfast, they would learn to English radio. It wasn't so much by reading, it wasn't so much by taking conventional classes. Um, and it wasn't even like I, you know, I uh, really learned a lot about English from watching Friends, you know. So we all have different ways and and places that we pick up languages. And I think if you recognize that, that can help you along in your language, specifically language journey. And I think learning in general, a lot of learning, like if you if you think back to what subjects that you really liked learning in school. It was more than the topic. It was the charisma of your teacher. It was the activities they made you do. It was uh, maybe they had you, uh, like if it was history, maybe they had you make cutouts or, you know, like do exciting projects where you'd learn about different countries and cultures. So it's definitely, learning is multimodal. It's never uni anything. Um, And so uh, having it just be multimodal can also help. Like instead of just saying, I'm just going to go take these language classes where I learn grammar the whole time. And then, you know, you're working hard, you're spending money on those classes, and then you do it for like a whole two years and you've come away doing nothing uh, or learning nothing, which is why I think like I, I mentioned earlier, like the immersion aspect, like when you move to a country it automatically becomes uh, multimodal. Because like when you see people talking, you're seeing their lips moving and the sound is coming at the same time. And then you see the kind of body language that language has and each language has its own body language, right? Because the silences in each language are different and uh, the pauses kind of dictate, like as I'm moving my hands, they're not random. And so, um, so, so all of those things change with language. And when you're in a country and immersed in their culture and, 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 and life, uh, you can pick it up a lot. Your brain can pick it up a lot faster um, than, than just taking language classes. Yes, such a good point. Wow, this is fascinating. Okay, so we do agree. Yeah, so we agree, really. Yeah. It's, you yeah. know, nature, nurture, but also maybe... Um, it sounds like you are saying too, which I think is that, you know, it just depends. It's a case by case. Yeah. You know, everybody's different. Yeah. Everybody's makeup, their genetics, everything will be different, right? Down to height to, I, you know, in my family, all the men are over six foot, that kind of thing. So there's always going to, I mean, why is that? And that's got to be genetics, you know? Yeah. So, because, you know, there are people who are shorter. So, yeah, but not in my family. So, yes, that's an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, so I can really see your passion for Mm -hmm. the topic, but also how it may have been easy for you to immerse yourself within it because you have a passion for it. Which brings me to ask you about your research. Okay. Um, because everybody, I think, sees research differently. Yep. I thought I was going to enjoy research when I did my master's. Okay. Okay. I did enjoy aspects of it, but I found yeah. certain bits difficult, of course. Yeah. And it's there for you to challenge you. Yeah. And I don't know where I got the idea that a master's in psychology wouldn't involve a lot of maths or anything. I don't know where that came from, but. Right when I had to do it, I was like, oh, because for whatever reason, I didn't have to do a mm. lot of it at school. Right. I'm not bad, but I'm not great. Yeah. But the research part, what was yeah. your experience of mm-hmm. research? Because you were so learned in your, um, I suppose, focus on 
the different aspects. So what was your yeah. doing the actual research? Yeah, so um, that's also, you know, I love your questions. You're amazing. Uh, so just a little aside before I get started with my answer. So um, while my general idea of what I wanted to do was clear from the beginning, I took a while kind of realizing what my actual research interest focus passion was and I still sometimes switch around a lot um, and that's for many reasons so I think uh, let me answer one by one your question so one question I think was uh, everybody's idea of research is different and I 100% agree and I think it's because so research by definition is going to the edge of our knowledge and trying to scrape out a little bit more. So we are, so our collective understanding of the world gets a little bit bigger, right? And so because it's at the edge, we're at the unknown edge, methods are changing all the time. Techniques are improving all the time. The, the hypotheses that we're testing are building upon each other. And more and more, uh, people are realizing that the way to solve the bigger questions in research is through team science efforts. We need multidisciplinary teams with diverse individuals um, who bring different ideas to the table. Not all ideas might work, but we need to bring and not have the same idea like kind of be perpetuated but kind of like bring these teams together and 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 I want to hit upon what you said as an example in a good research team the fact that you were not interested in doing the maths should not have stopped your research career progression so I will say I think math is a lot of the time fundamental to life like we need to have math skills to do basic personal finance and basic life skills you need to know when to go to buy like groceries because groceries are running out so so I'm not talking about basic basic math skills but the whole idea of in for me anyway and I think a lot of my colleagues and and the amazing mentors that I've learned from over the years is that you don't need to necessarily be good at everything so the the graduate school process, however, is a little bit different. So when you're learning either in your master's or your PhD, you should try doing everything. So that's like a learning process of what the research enterprise is. So you kind of you look. So basically, you look at what's already been done. So that's the background research. You read papers and you try to figure out what do we know so far and what do we need to know to move this forward, move the science forward, to move, to help people, to get to the drug, whatever it is. And then you design your hypothesis that you're testing. And then you have to design another, another source of frustration that I've seen through the years for people is that they don't match the method to their hypothesis mm -hmm. and they find failure. Mm -hmm. So uh, in neuroscience in particular, which is my field, um, so we have, uh, broadly speaking, in human research, two technologies that people use. One is electroencephalography, which is EEG, short EEG. You might have heard where it's you put a cap on top of your head and there are electrodes running out and people are measuring um, electricity, uh, electric signals, not electricity, I, I apologize, electric signals from the top of your head and these get amplified by an amplifier and then you can look at them and then there are uh there we do have quite a good understanding of where these signals might be coming from based on an understanding of how electric fields are generated and flow but at the same time the spatial resolution is not great like you're not going to know exactly where the signal has come from in the brain right but it's very fast you're getting signals at the millisecond level um and so if 
So, so, and and the second thing about that technology is that it is very cheap and very versatile. So now people are trying to design it um, as technology gets better every day. They're trying to design it without wires to be wireless, so people can just wear it as they're doing everyday work. And imagine what a what a wealth of knowledge that can give you at the individual level and at the group level, right? So, like, what is your brain doing as you're cooking, as you're watering your plant, you know, so things like that as you're moving and walking and sleeping and going about your day. Okay. But then again, it doesn't give you a window into where these things are happening. Just the link of the timing and how these signals are changing related to each other at different points on your skull. The other one, which maybe people are more familiar with, is the magnetic resonance imaging. So that's when you go into the scanner and you get a nice, pretty picture of your brain. Um, and so those are really, really poor timing. So, so they basically are taking a picture at every slice of your brain. So the, the camera is taking a picture there. It's not a camera, but uh, just to, to simplify what is going on. And then they move a few millimeters, a picture, a few more, a few millimeters, a picture as people are doing tasks in the, in the scanner. And then it goes back up and then, you know, takes the same picture. So the, so the time difference between one picture in the same location and the next is, is, is high. Mm -hmm. It's not compared to EEG. Mm -hmm. So if I, as a researcher want to look at where in the brain something is happening for a particular task, even if e fMRI experiments are more expensive, I cannot answer the question using EEG because my base question is about where and not when, mm -hmm. right? And so those kinds of, and, and that's a very obvious example, but when we get into the reads of it, some questions are not always obvious and then people end up, choosing not quite the right method. And the same goes for the analysis techniques as well. And then you get frustrated because you spent years of your life or a year, whatever, working on this project and it didn't give you, give you um, the yields that you wanted. But I think for me, that is also contributing to the collective knowledge. So that kept me going. Like even when my experiments didn't work, okay, so now... The next person doing the similar kind of experiment knows not to know not knows not to know what I did. Yeah. You know, when they don't work, you know, or you know, the method was wrong. So, so it does help, but then people can get disheartened. So my my personal research experience, it has been quite good in some points. My PhD experience was amazing. Um, sometimes it's frustrating. Uh, <clears throat> so I've, I've definitely had experiments that failed or, you know, um, just difficult situations that come up in life that can interfere with your work life and things like that. And, <clears throat> and, and like I said, my mentors, I've been lucky. And, and I think if there are listeners who are interested in maybe pursuing a research career, I would recommend uh, you pick your mentor. Uh, as long as they're in vaguely in the science that you like, because mentorship is huge in science. So does that answer all of your questions? Okay. Yes. Never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now. Thank you for your support. You make this podcast possible. Now, back to the show. Excellent stuff. Yeah, the fMRI stuff has been fascinating recently. There's yeah. so much uh, information that's coming through where they're able to yep. start to look at emotions now. Yeah, so it, it'd be interesting to keep on top of that. I'm always looking. Absolutely, to see what's coming? And and sorry, I didn't mean oh, to interrupt. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, speaking of exciting fMRI, one of the things that I've really been fascinated by is um, this idea of called dense fMRI. Yes. Um, and so it's they take one par participant and keep recording them. Uh, so some people do it at different times of the day to kind of get an idea of how their brain networks are fluctuating over time. Uh, some people like this one study I'm thinking of right now, um, 
they took a woman um, and she's a 23 year old woman and they recorded uh, her brain and they took a blood sample for her hormone level. So looking at estrogen and progesterone and did an fMRI for every day of her entire cycle. A menstrual cycle. And then they correlated her brain signals with her hormone levels every single day. And they're now trying to do the same thing with men over their cycle. And then the other thing they did in that particular study is a year. So after that's the first month after they recorded her, they put her on a um, birth control which flattens progesterone. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, birth control uh, usually flattens one or both. Anyway, so this particular one flattens progesterone through the cycle. And they did the same experiment uh, a year later. So when she, after she'd been on birth control for a full year, and the results were stunning. Like there were changes in volumetric volumetric changes in parts of the brain. Um, and yeah, they're complex results. I don't need to go into them now, but there's very exciting things that are constantly happening in research to kind of keep the nerdy soul like me <laughs> hooked for life. Yeah, well, there's yeah. a nerdy soul in me as well. But yeah. I, certainly I'm more, I'm more interested in, I think because of my field, how fMRI will help to inform uh, the emotional state, especially trauma. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned yeah. trauma earlier. Yeah, yeah. And I know some research is being done about that, and has absolutely time because I think they're finding as well that the brain is, reacts very differently uh, when yes. someone's in a traumatic state or when they're triggered or being than it does when not. And so that's yeah. extremely fascinating. Yeah. Right. Wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, gosh, um, I could go off on a tangent and, and ask you about these things. So, so your research experience was good. That's good. You, you did describe it, you know, a little bit mixed as well, where yeah. you had, and that, that sounds like a healthy research experience. Really. <laughs> it's meant to challenge yeah. us. It's meant to do all of that stuff. And, and that's yeah. why it's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> I don't believe. <laughs> yeah, it did get tough at times, but I, I cannot tell you a single researcher who it didn't get tough for exactly. at some point. Yeah. It's, well, exactly. Absolutely. But it's so needed. And yeah. you just have to keep encouraging, which brings me to your passion about helping mm -hmm. younger people understand yep. neuroscience and Particularly, yeah. you're, you're helping people to understand how the brain uh, reacts to so, sight, sound. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit more about that because you're an author yeah. in the book as well. Um, I that, have, yeah. So tell us about how that all came about. Yeah. So it's a little bit historic for me because, like I said, I was in India when I... Um, decided I wanted to do this. And uh, there, you know, like now there are a lot of STEM resources for kids to learn uh, science, technology, engineering, math, um, uh, for like in hands on ways, you can go to museums, and there's like very like a broken down way of teaching some concepts, not all. Um, I didn't really have a lot of resources. Uh, I didn't have teachers who are specialized in neuroscience, people hadn't really or it hadn't the topic hadn't made it as something big uh, in India when I got so interested. And I, I, I wasn't. I, I do like psychology, but I was more interested in the mechanisms behind, like you know, what's happening in the brain. Um, and so, so I, I had to go and look up in encyclopedias about the brain, and and you know, what are the what. What, what is the cortex? What is the midbrain? What is brainstem? And so I had to do a lot of that work. So I think as soon as I started grad school, actually, even in undergrad, I was like, well, you know, the other, the other aspect to this too is most of the time funding for research comes from the public. It comes from taxpayer money. It comes from generous donations to philanthropic foundations. Um, and, uh, you know, when science is communicated, a lot of the time it's communicated to other scientists 
And I, through the years, I've seen there's so much confusion about how to report science, how to interpret science, how to like, so how does a journalist read the, read an article and realize what is the main takeaway given the nuances? Because like most of the time when we're doing an experiment, it's a controlled experiment in a lab setting. And then uh, a great example is in Alzheimer's, if you see every day there's a report, Alzheimer has been cured in mice. But we know what the state is <laughs> in actually finding a therapeutic that's effective and, 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 uh, and disease modifying, you know, disease modifying from biological perspective. And so, you know, and, and there needs to be a nuance. And I think there's, that's often lost. And then there's also this um, race to grab the attention of the reader without necessarily, because it's a, it's, you know, fleeting. You made you made like twenty million viewers read your news article, but they don't follow up necessarily all the time about what happened with that research over a long term, and if it was a one time fluke, like reproducibility. It's they're now calling it a reproducibility crisis, and it's the same in research, unfortunately, where uh, a lot of people are running after novelty. Right. And what's novel in research? And I did say in the beginning that it's at the scrape of, you know, what we know and we're trying to get that knowledge. But at the same time, you know, we all know this just because something happens one way once doesn't mean it's going to consistently happen that way. So science, when done right, is often boring. It's doing the same thing over and over and over and over until you have enough of a statistical sample for it to mean something real, for it to be a real phenomenon that can be reproducible, that is reproducible. So, yeah. Um, and that's the first thing <laughs> we're taught, isn't it? That your, your research, your project should be reproducible. That's yeah. what you're aiming for. Sorry, go ahead. Yes. No, no, you're absolutely right. We're taught that, but it's not always reflected in the research landscape. I'm sorry to say that's, you know, anyway. So I said a, a lot of people quit. A lot of people, and, and it's because they hit these major like hurdles of like, you know, people. Anyway, so I <laughs> don't need to go into like a, a tangent about that. So, yeah, so. Uh, I might have <laughs> lost the thread a little bit of your original question. Um, would you it mind reminding about, me? Yeah, it was just about how you got to the point where you wanted to start to teach children. To, yeah, to teach children. Yeah, I mean, thank you. Um, and so I've been doing like, for me, communicating back to the public in a relatable, engageable way. What we know, along with the nuances of the limitations of every research. There's every research project, there's going to be some limitation. And so communicating those has been really important to me. And it's been as important to me to get the skills for communicating uh, throughout my career as it has been to become a better scientist every day. And so uh, I worked on journals. I was editor or student run journals for my undergrad and grad school um, journals where I would interview people and, you know, written interviews and about, but of topics. So like one of the, one of my favorite pieces that I did back then was uh, this article about cognitive enhancers and this. So at the time we were in grad school and a lot of people were, taking these sleep modifying drugs to stay awake all night um, uh, to, to cram for that exam, you know? And so I did a, I did a little short article, like one or two pages, and it was aimed for the graduate community and beyond. And, you know, kind of a philosophical discussion about why is the society kind of going after marks and why is that kind of intelligence valued more than others to the point where people are willing to risk their sleep uh, risk? Cause like when you mess up your sleep, your brain changes a lot and sometimes it's recoverable. Some of it is not. And so, but people are so desperate 
sometimes and feel so much pressure that they do they take these and and you know uh, i'm talking about drugs but then even a coffee can be considered a cognitive enhancer because it can help you stay up all night to do the to the job and it's the same it's idea a, you know it's a stimulant yeah yeah stimulants any stimulant that you take so so you know i've been doing this for a while i do like um little workshops for kids and to to like hands on activities show them videos of brain surgeries and get an get a <laughs> get some kind of excited reaction out of them and so been doing this for a while it kind of came together for me a couple of years ago so i started painting initially just for myself i painted these uh neuroscience paintings that i hung up in my room in my apartment cuz i like the brain and uh, i had colleagues and friends over and they were like oh no you got to keep doing these cuz these are very visually appealing and and you know so i started making them uh and then a friend uh here in dc invited me to show it in in her gallery um at one of these like um uh, art all night kind of events where people just kind of go from gallery to gallery and they're they're checking out art from local artists and so I did a couple of those and uh, simultaneously I've also been tutoring um with an organization in DC called uh, Reading Partners and so that organization what they do is they identify kids who are behind the the reading level of their peers and then match them up one on one with a tutor it can be anyone um and they get one on one attention and they read together it's very simple so they just we pick well, like i mean we do some other exercises as well but the majority of the half an hour or 45 minutes either the kid is reading and i'm listening or i'm reading to the kid and it's it's been a very fulfilling experience for me and uh i was like i want to i want to share you know cuz you do you're paired with the kid for a whole year or until they graduate uh out of the program and they're now like read at the reading level of their peers and you know you want to share i wanted to share my passion and look for neuroscience books and there were not many you know they're not at least not looking at the anatomy of the brain and looking at uh what how brains make us special every single individual is special our brains are amazing so like if you're feeling low listen to this next segment because your brain is so amazing it's doing things all the time that are mind boggling if you think about it so a good example is if you have a drink in front of you and you lift it up with your hand and you drink it and you put it down the weight of the item has now changed right you can do this with closed eyes too so it's not just visual input it's also tactile input um every time we pick up a glass whether you're at a party or whether you're by yourself the weight and the volume have changed so the grip strength that you need to pick it up is different if you grip something too hard if it's like a plastic cup it can crush uh it can break you know depending on what the material is uh if it's too low it's going to slip from your fingers but you know unless someone is completely inebriated or or have some kind of disorder most of our brains are doing this unconsciously all the time our brains are amazing you're all amazing individually so i kind of wanted a book that would do that and i you know so i was like you know i'm going to write one cuz i think i have the skills to do it and i have these paintings and i'm going to find a way to convey to children and adults that you know having <clears throat> an unusual ability makes you stronger like being weird can be a source of strength so for me it was also a very philosophical endeavor and of course at the core of it i did want to communicate neuroscience that it can be fun and exciting and 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 grab the attention uh at a younger age um i also really think that the way that these topics are taught can be um off putting like i i like i was saying earlier you know the teachers in your favorite subject in school a lot of it depends on how it's taught 
And, you know, there's a lot, it's very easy to discourage women from pursuing careers in science and math. Um, and there's also an effect of, uh, of demographics, you know, certain, certain people are just discouraged, discouraged from pursuing a certain kind of career. And I wanted to remove all of that. And as much as I could, so I, I deliberately had a d have a non-anthropocentric kind of view. So there are no humans, no one animal is better than the other. They're all equal. They're all beautiful and different in their own way. And all of them have superpowers. Every single one has a superpower. Um, and it's coming from one of their senses. And it's more than the human, what's considered the traditional five human sensors of seeing or hearing or tasting. It goes into things that we're doing internally, like right now, like you're we, we, we know where our muscles are. You know if your fist is clenched or not, even if your eyes cl are closed, even if you're upside down. So there are internal sensory mechanisms. And then there are animals that can just do absolutely amazing things. Like butterflies can see polarized light. They split light into its more than its component parts almost. And they can see exactly where the sun's position is because they can see this polarized light, even when it's cloudy. And that's how these monarch butterflies are making the trek from Canada to Mexico. Mm. Um, and, and there are sharks. And this one personally blew my mind because I didn't know this before I started researching my book. But there are sharks and rays um, and, and so uh, that can sense electric fields. So now there are electric eels and there are certain other animals that send out electric waves. That's a little bit different because they're trying to shock their prey into immobility. They also can sense a little bit of electricity, but that's a little bit different. It doesn't mean they don't have that ability. But sharks and rays are passively sensing electric fields. All living things have electric and magnetic fields. And so it helps them track their prey, um, even in an environment like at the bottom of the sea where there's no light, um, they're able to find their prey and they're able to survive and they're apex predators, really. Um, and so, you know, so I wanted to kind of talk about those as well. And it's not meant to be a comprehensive list, but I try to highlight different families of these sensory um sensory abilities if you will um and so like each kind of unique um family of sensory uh, abilities that are in the animal kingdom doesn't mean tomorrow they're not gonna find something new uh but yeah so that's the motivation and the story behind my book if you'd like to be a guest on the show email us at inquire at the inquisitive rin.com that's E-N-Q-U-I-R-E at theinquisitiveren.com. Be sure to check all social media, especially the Facebook page, for new topics being discussed. And if you can contribute, please let us know so you can be a guest on the show. Now, back to the show. Yes, behind the book. And listeners, viewers, we're talking about Dr. Jaya's book. It is Baby Senses, a Sensory Neuroscience Primer for All Ages. And it's out now. It's available. A link will be in the show notes as well. So you were motivated to write the book because really, it, as you just explained as well, visually, you're showing people, the people who respond more visually to information, how these things happen. I suppose on an emotional, spiritual level in some way, we're all, you know, everybody has gifts and different and superpowers and we're yeah. all different. The brain, as you so succinctly explained, is yeah. fascinating and wonderful and we're all different. Yeah. And I, I would think that children especially respond so well to that because they're yeah. at the stage when they want to be king of the boss of everything and everyone. Yeah. So just encouraging them and motivating them to find out more about how they think 
and why they behave the way they behave, perhaps, or why they can hear yeah. things, see things, and how yeah. it's not specific to humans, that it's it goes to animals as well, would be helpful. The children relate. They always yeah. look at other people, other things. Yeah. But would you say that's the case? Has that been your experience of working with children? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think so. A couple of things I did too was to make all of the conversations between parents and children or like adults and children. So the kid is like, but how do we do this? And then the parent answers, you know, this is our superpower. And then without going into too much technical jargon, tells the kid, like, we're able to be friends with this microorganism that we're symbiotic, like we have a symbiotic relationship with. I'm paraphrasing, but so, so without going to like, just kind of making it very logical and not about the sciencey words, but about what is actually happening. Like, okay, owls can hear really well. Well, what did they do with it? You know, they sing duets to each other all night. They sing back and forth. It's amazing. So it's, so, so the children's book, part of it, really goes into those kinds of things to kind of grab the attention. The other thing I did too was like, I I myself recited the words of the rhymes out multiple times to make sure the cadence and the rhythm flowed. So if a parent wants to sing it to their child or wants to read it to their children or the educator wants to read it to a classroom of kids, there is some kind of rhythm to the sound, so for mo- the more auditory learners, uh, you know, and ideally someday I'd like to do, um, start doing these like paint the brain sessions where they can look at the image and then, uh, and, and, and do it themselves. So to kind of like engage this multimodal learning to get kids excited about the brain. Um, there is a glossary in the back that I put in for the adults and they kind of go into, and even for that, like I really try to make it relatable to everybody's life. So what do you, you know, there's, okay, there's smells and, 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 you know, someone might read it and go, but what do I care? Uh, you know, that, that someone might, you know, you know, so I was like, well, let me try to relate it back to everyday life. And so for every single sense, I go into the contemporary research. And then I go into how it relates back to everyday life. So for example, with smells, they're now trying to, uh, by they, I mean, generally, some researchers who are working on this, they are trying to develop sensors that are uh, mimicking their like bio-inspired design. So they're like the nose, but they're helping detect chemical leaks from, from factories. And so, you know, at very high sensitivity, so we can kind of get a better handle on, on emissions and, and, and try to reduce those and know exactly when there's a leak to shut things down. And so every single sensory modality has been actually historically hugely influencing, influencing technology, uh, development, medicine, uh, infrared. So snakes can do thermal imaging. And that's huge. Now they're trying to use um, the same kind of sensing technology in tumor detection. So tumors in general are more metabolically active than the rest of your body. And so they are warmer. Mm -hmm. And so instead of chemo or, I mean, not like instead of or in addition to maybe depends on the, the type of cancer too, but if you're able to precisely differentiate the cancerous cell from the normal cell, that can really revolutionize cancer medicine, you know, and so, and, and night vision goggles and the military. So, so all of these senses, even though they're like exotic animals, they they do relate back to, 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 to everyday life. And, uh, and I, my goal or my, my wish, maybe not my goal, my wish is, if there are inquisitive children or older children uh, and, and they want to learn more, they don't need to now go to the internet and look it up. They can just flip to the back of the book and read more. And then the parents, if it's a very small child, parents can, a uh, young child, parents can read it and then explain it to their children in their own words, in their own way. Um, so the questions of, but why can still be answered. Oh, excellent. Because that is yeah. a child's favorite. Favorite question. Yeah. Why? How? Why? Yeah. 
why is the stop sign red? Uh, yeah, so that, why, yeah. Is it, why does that exist? Yes, yeah, so yeah. excellent stuff. This is brilliant. And maybe that's your next, um, I mean, it's got to happen now because you're, especially with the painting and the painting images, that's your thing. So I, yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing it happen. <laughs> Yeah, the you mean the next book? The next I book? do. Then yeah, I do have several ideas in mind. Uh, yeah, one of them is uh, I I don't mind talking about it. One one of them is looking at um, weird behaviors. Uh, it, like I don't mean like human behaviors. I mean like sleep is a behavior. Oh yes. Uh, but then there are animals like dolphins and and basically marine mammals sleep half a brain at a time because. They need to periodically come up for air because they have lungs in an aquatic environment. And so if they fully fall asleep, they're going to drown. They're not going to come up for air. So they've evolved to like sleep half a brain at a time. And so in behaviors, there's also some really cool evolution, um, evolutionary things like songbirds that learn the, the, the zebra finch. Uh, the males teach their sons the same song and then each individual puts their own twist on it so the bass rhythm is the same but it's like a fingerprint for them each individual has their own unique song and it's so that a female knows not to mate with a genetic relative because the because you know when they grow up the females don't learn to sing but they hear the father's song and they hear the brothers learning the father's songs and so they learn the bass pattern as well and so they learn the bass patterns and when they're out there in the wild as adults looking for mates they know not to mate with the same pattern bass pattern that is incredible so we really yeah. are the most intelligent species in, i guess yeah that's, that's incredible we don't have anything like that we're, we're more depending on common sense I suppose. yeah yeah wow. so yeah humans are uh and tell me if i don't need to go off on this tangent but i'll just say one thing uh <laughs> speaking of humans being the best animal or not there's a, a an interesting idea about that and i think so it centers around the fact that there are no close human genetic relatives and that's because we either absorbed or killed off mm -hmm. the competition so like neanderthals for a long time were believed to have been uh destroyed by um humans but actually homo sapiens have absorbed neanderthals into our genetics so a lot of these com uh, comparative uh genetic studies are not possible in humans because we don't have any close genetic neighbors. So the closest one is a different family. They're the chimps, they're, they're monkeys, they're not uh, the hominid species. And um, so because of that, the hypothesis is that it is a continuum. There's just a gap in the continuum, like continuum of abilities. And yes, humans have evolved a little bit extra in some ways, um, but all of these abilities, even consciousness, is a continuum. Any animal that needs to plan for the future needs to kind of travel back and forth in time in their mind. And this is a theory, right? And, and, and that is the source of conscious experience. It's like you need to store these complex um, vignettes in your mind in order to plan for the future based on the experiences of your, of your past. And the further out that you need to go either way, the larger your conscious experience of the world will be. But that means even, even like small animals are capable, like squirrels that store acorns for the winter are capable of having a conscious experience of the world. And so, yeah, so that's, uh, you know, my little tangent about that. And I think uh, there are certainly things that, so for me, the things that humans have done that are truly unique are, it's not even language, it's the written language. It's the fact that we have developed a way to accumulate knowledge and pass it on. That's what no other species has been able to do until now. It's that writing so that now 
you don't have to repeat what your parents did. You can learn from them and then take it further in anything, in technology. In, and that's really the reason why we have all these big buildings. If we had, hadn't invented writing, then we would still be each of us learning to cut a tree to make fire, right? And, and cook our food and not like have come this far as, as a species, yeah. Yes, I suppose I wonder about the first scribes and and how and I know there's some research out there, but um, how how that all came about and because it was it was on the cusp, it was inventive, wasn't it? It was new. I'm looking for the word I can't find it, but it was just yeah. innovative in that state, and we've carried it on. But it was obviously yeah. something inbuilt skill that we we had as as humans i always look yeah. at even einstein or whoever the, walking around thinking okay what can i do next let me try this let's try that and that's fascinating and that is i hope as you described it earlier i hope that children especially yeah start to feel that okay what 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 can i learn next what can we do yeah. with that if i take that and that and that and put it together what will happen? What, and that was the excitement of chemistry class for me, or yeah. you know, the excitement of biology class, or the excitement of opening up my first psychology book. It was, yeah. okay, so if I do that and that, then what's going to happen? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and so yeah. that excitement has to come across, and I suppose we have yeah. that. And somehow how we learn to write, somebody said, okay, if I take that stick, and press it onto that, or if I yeah. do that, then that, yeah. then what will happen? Oh, oh my God, it's a line, or it's a whatever. How exciting. Yeah. Ha ja yeah. Has that been lost, Jaya, when you look at our world now? Mm -hmm. and look, we're going to get philosophical just for a moment, because this is what we do. Please. <laughs> um, Please. We, technology's great, and I always yeah. like to say, you know, there was a Stone Age, there was the Ice Age, there was all that. Yeah. And we're in the technological, the information age. Yeah. But we, I love what you said about consciousness. Gosh, you, you have so many tidbits there. I, um, I'm getting lost in my own head about them. But what you said before about consciousness being continuum, I love yeah. that. Absolutely love that. But with our youth and us as well, um, mm -hmm. you know, the older gen, me, the older generation, we're embracing technology, but is it is it positive for science? We know mm. how it's positive for science in many in the obvious ways. Yeah, yeah. But is it is it striking the interest of younger people to study it, or are they being distracted by the shiny yeah. thing, the shiny thing? <laughs> yeah, I mean that's a. Uh... That's a really thought-provoking question, and I'm glad you asked it. And I think for me, though, like I, technology inherently isn't good or bad. It just gives us the ability to do something we weren't able to do before, like the internet. Mm. You know, um, inherently it's not good or bad. Some people use it to buy and sell and trade things that they shouldn't. Some people use it to learn and pull themselves out. And technology in some countries, like I can tell you in mine, in India, um, uh, technology, like when, when, when cell phones first came out and, you know, like, I, I, I don't know about the rest of the world, but uh, in India, what, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say this, but whatever, I'll, I'll go ahead. I commit to, commit to saying this. But like a lot of the time, people will buy an expensive product, take it apart, and then learn how it's put together and then start making cheap knockoffs. That's not just India. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, I, yeah, this happened when I was not in India. Names. So, it's yeah, not yeah. just India. <laughs> okay. And, uh, you know, and, 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 and a lot of people are like against that because they're cheap knockoffs or not or whatever. But then what it did in India, which has a large, poor and illiterate population, is it got all of those people who could now afford a cell phone on the internet. And now they are connected. They have bank accounts. 
they have resources, they can find their jobs, and now the internet is in multiple languages. And so it has actually become a democratizer, right? And then in other countries, we all know how internet has been misused. And I, I even now, like the big AI thing, and you know, it's the same thing. I'm like, it can, it, in and of of itself, it's just an, an an ability like electricity that can that, that that gives us an ability to do something that we couldn't do before. And it always comes down to individuals, and individuals, unfortunately, you know, given the the variety and and what we discussed earlier, like people have different intentions going in and how they use it. And some people want to make the quick buck and that's all they're focused on. Some people are like, oh, let's actually start a start a, a foundation and collect money and fund Alzheimer's research. And so, so there's different kinds of, you know, all these Facebook campaigns to like uh, do fundraising for people's birthdays and stuff. So at the individual level, at the corporation corporation level, we see this all the time. So yeah, to me, like, it's a little bit hard to predict. I will say I, for me, like what I have noticed, at least since the pandemic is a lot of people have unfortunately, or are, are seem, seems like they are in the process of losing a lot of soft skills. Um, I see now, and, and, and it's because we were so isolated and just, you know, in our homes for a couple of years. And for some children, unfortunately, it was during their development, critical development period in social development uh, or whatever. And so they are more comfortable having conversations on messenger than they are face to face. And they're not making eye contact when they're having conversation. And to me, you know, it's like eye contact is everything. You know, you can see a person's soul through their eyes. And so if you never learn to look, how are you going to see, you know, whether a person's intentions are good or bad when you're having a conversation with them? And so I see sometimes the lack of soft skills um, in generations that have been exposed to too much technology from a young age, like kids who are playing with iPads. Um, and, I, and I get it. Parents are getting busier. You know, women didn't used to work 50 years ago. I certainly don't want it to revert to that. And so when moms and dads are working, sometimes children, um, you know, do need to be distracted with something. I get it. But it's I think there has to be a balance like and um, maybe it should be a school subject. Maybe it's something that parents and caregivers should prioritize teaching their kids, especially coming out of the pandemic to kind of be like, hey, let's not forget we are a social species, human beings, our brains evolved to be social. You know, we have incredible facial recognition skills. Yeah. Just facial recognition. You can see your person, whatever they are, whoever, mother, parent, partner, whatever, in a crowd. You can spot them out in a crowd of 100, 100 uh, faces. Same thing with, with voices, right? You can talk to someone on the phone and, you know, the phone actually distorts sounds quite a bit. It cuts off at certain frequencies and it's quite a narrow band of information that you're getting through the phone compared to when you're face to face. You can understand, you can, you can recognize your person on the phone compared to everyone else. And so our brains really evolved to be social, to, to relate to each other, to empathize, to put ourselves in each other's shoes. And so if we take that away too much or don't expose children in, in developmental periods to those social um, learning experiences, that can be, in my uh, humble opinion, quite detrimental as they go forward in life. And because I, you know, what I see now in from like an employed person perspective is those skills are almost valued more than technical skills, because the technical skills, as I alluded to earlier, you can pick up over time. If you really want to learn something, if you really want to learn a, a software, if you really need to do math, you can talk to your supervisor and get like a math software 
and get it done. So if that's an essential component of your job, you find a way to do it. Soft skills, like if you if you do a good job and your company is like, if you do a good job and we'll send you to these conferences or we'll send you as a representative of our company to these high level meetings where you can network, those kinds of situations are are going to be incredibly hard for people without soft skills. Absolutely. Such a good point. Um, I have a friend who's a recruitment consultant and we were Mm -hmm. having coffee the other day and she said, we're talking about just work. And she said, you know what? She said, everybody I interview these days, she said, nobody looks me in the eye. Mm. She also said that she said, and they're using slang in their interviews. And I said, what? She said, yeah, they're, they're actually saying things like that you find on Twitter or something. They're using slang. And, and she said, and they're just doing it like it's accepted. I said, because that's how that's what they're used to now. Yeah. So when you were saying that, I was just thinking, wow, we were just mm-hmm. talking about this the other day. And that's from yep. a consultant. So yep. they recruits people. And yep. she's with a big, big firm as well. So it is concerning, and yeah. yes, your point about social skills, I mean, the whole iPad, television, internet, focused, staring at it, it is a disruption, I believe, in our mm-hmm. social skills and our social development, because yep. we learn negotiation through being outside, playing with our friends, you know, we, we learn how to one-up each other out there. Yep learn how yep. passionate and empathetic just being yep. out there and being with people and friends that's your learning that's your your uh, i believe your ground yep. learning. yes it happens at school but once you come home and of course everybody doesn't have siblings so yeah you not learn it at home some people are in one parent home some people are yep. in in foster homes and other situations there's lots going on <laughs> the world is yep. different you know Everybody. Yeah. So thank you for saying that because I I think that is being yeah. lost. But I yeah. think as you said, technology is wonderful and yeah. it's helpful and it's an advancement and thank goodness for it. But we I, I believe we have to use it like everything else has come along. Yeah. Um, yeah. as an enhancement, as something yeah. that enhances your life but doesn't take over your life. Absolutely. Absolutely. You hit the nail. That That is exactly right. Yeah. All about that. I know I feel yeah. wonderful when I haven't turned on my computer for a day or so. I can manage it. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, with traveling, just not looking at the phone so much. There is a freedom, I think, in that. So, yep. Um, but somebody who's curious and you, you do want to have a look at the news and things like that. Sure. But I think, you know, I think you've hit upon a very, very insightful point, because I think that's really reflect in this kind of increase in ecotourism and people who just want to switch off and go into the wild and tune out the world. And I think, you know, our brains are at certain points getting overloaded with information. There's semantic information and then there's information that's useful for survival. And if you're getting overloaded with something, your your brains are going to say, no, enough. I need a break. Absolutely. Which brings me to ask you, what do you do for fun, for your breaks? When you take a break away and you give your what do you like to do? Yeah. So I so I'm very close to my 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 family. Uh, for me, it's a huge source of of um, joy in my life that, you know, now we have this technology that allows me to look at them every day, even though we're far apart. My family still, my parents are still back in India, uh, but I get to chat with them every single day. So that's, you know, things like that are, are very um, uh, joyful to me. Uh, beyond that, outside of work, I really try to have every day something that is not work related, even though I do get joy out of my work. Like I said, I'm, I'm passionate about it, but I try to paint. Sometimes it's listening to music that I like. 
uh, switching off and just listening to the music. I even am one of those old school people with like a CD player that with like, you know, listening to my childhood music or just CDs from like a trip to New Orleans where I heard some great bands, you know, whatever. Um, sometimes, uh, if I've had like an intense deadline or something, I even binge watch shows without really watching them. I just kind of like tune everything out and kind of just watch these like legal dramas that have nothing to do with neuroscience or science and just kind of like immerse myself into it or fantasy shows like the Witcher. I love the Witcher. Um, and so kind of like, you know, tuning, tuning things out is really good. I think it recharges your brain. I love traveling as well that happens less frequently sometimes than others depending on the time of the year but traveling um, not necessarily to just eco travel but that is I do like going um, I went whale watching Cape Cod that was amazing um, and I went to New Orleans not so much eco but the music was amazing kind of like put like taking myself out of my bubble and putting myself in different shoes and that has been very rejuvenating. I do a lot of art. Um, like I said, when I first started doing it, I did it for at least three hours a week. And I still do it. It's not every week at this point, just because of certain work commitments sometimes. Uh, but I try. I try to do it every week for three hours. Um, <clears throat> I started, uh, so like recently, I'm like, I just want to do something new. So I started hand building classes so that's pottery um but it's not it's not a uh, clay sculptures i've done that before with my french art teacher she taught me how to make some sculptures but this is actually building things you can use so like i have a casserole dish i have a couple of bowls and a plate and they're they look handmade believe me I've shown them to people and they're like oh this looks like a ruin like something you might find at like an ancient ruin it's all wobbly and whatever but there's a joy in creating things there's a joy in learning something new and using your hands and those three hours or four hours that I'm making this pot I'm making this thing my brain's switched off my hands are kneading, they're shaping, I'm seeing if it's level. And, you know, and so it's, it's been a really good kind of way to switch off. And I think I try to do that. Every time I recognize the beginnings of a burnout. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody works in different ways. But I think I tend to go into intense bursts of productivity and creativity, followed by some time intense bursts of like I need just need like a weekend uh to do nothing and kind of like switch off and recharge myself and and make sure I don't take on any work commitments for that weekend and just switch off and do pottery or paint or go out with my friends and travel somewhere so yeah that's how I found my balance but I think it's important to to recognize that I think we tend to live in workaholic cultures where it's celebrated to be working all the time. But that is not who we are. That's not who we are as a species. We're not workaholics, um, especially working for an abstract thing like money. It's one thing like if we're like back when we were hunter gatherers and we were working hard because we needed food for our families. That's completely different. And so, you know, I think a lot of the diseases that we're seeing are stress related because we're we're doing this to ourselves and it's not a good way to live. Um, working out is healthy, doing, getting a little, but it doesn't mean that you have to be a gym rat. You can do 10 minutes, 12 minutes of something, walking outside, getting some fresh air, do something physical every day for a few minutes and, 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 you know, try to like use in, in, in neuroscience, there's a saying, uh, use it or lose it. And it goes to like, um, cortical space. So like, if you don't use a certain skill over time, you get rusty and it goes for languages. It goes for like, if you don't play the guitar for 10 years and you pick it up, it's not like you can't do it, but you're going to be rusty. Um, and that's because like cortical real estate is precious. And if you're not using something, that area gets recruited to do something else that you do need. Yes. So it's that. It's just you got to flex that muscle if you want to use it.
So, Jaya, this has been fascinating, amazing. Mm -hmm. But if somebody was interested in neuroscience, where would mm -hmm. you say they should start? Let's say they're um, they're thinking about choosing it as a topic. Yep. Uh, they're undergrad. Um, yeah. Where they start, and also, what type of work jobs are available for? Right. Right. So both are brilliant questions. So one of the nice things about neuroscience is because it's very, very multidisciplinary. So you can, the brain is something that it's kind of like uh, one of my professors said, it's the Renaissance period of the brain because we don't know of understanding the brain because we don't know so much about how brains work. Every single discovery is hugely like, wow i wonder what that means and so it each each little thing is like spawning off 20 other kind of research lines you know so so it's it's definitely a very booming period and there's very different ways to enter it so i i started my master's as an engineer i did not so i have i mean i was a bioengineer biotechnology is my background um in undergrad um, and then I did neuroscience and then I went into cognitive neuroscience and, I, and then I did neurophysiology in my postdoc. So neurophysiology is actually recording from electrodes in the brain and looking at brain signals right up close and personal. Um, and so that was my trajectory. There are neuroscientists who never uh, look at the systems level. So I was looking at systems level because I was recording from multiple areas or doing EG, fMRI, and trying to like put it, what is happening at the network level? Um, so what area is talking to what area in order to, so for me, the, the areas of interest were learning and memory. Mm -hmm. And so perception, learning, and memory. So the three things. So like we get our stimuli from the environment. And sometimes we learn, sometimes it's a familiar stimulus. And then if it's a familiar stimulus, you have to compare it almost to the bank of other things you know. And if it's a novel stimulus, you do the same. And then you're like, oh, it's not, it's nothing I've encountered before. So you kind of classify it as a new thing. And then so it comes into memory, comes into play. So that's, I call it a bank because I'm an engineer and that's how I kind of picture it in my brain. And, and then, so you have all these like little computations and then on the output side, again, you have a list or, or, or a, a bank of options for behavioral outputs. And so like, if your phone rings, you want to answer your phone, you don't want to go open the door. So you have to match the input based on all these things happening inside to the output. So I was looking at this at a systems level. How does these outputs happen? from start to finish. There are people who decide to look at it at the molecular level. So what's happening in um, like not even the cellular, but on inside the cell, what's happening in molecules as we age, mm -hmm. uh, what's happening in part A versus part B. Um, how does, how do brains develop? So there's some very exciting research now. They're starting to grow brains in a dish. And so you're looking, you're mimicking in utero. It doesn't go all the way because it, it, it doesn't differentiate as nicely as a human brain does in, in utero. But we know enough to mimic the early stage of in utero development. So I think it's up to, don't quote me on this, but it might be up to like seven or eight weeks that we're able to grow brains in a dish. And that tells us a lot about early development. And then people can then do some lead exposure in this medium in a dish and see how that affects the disorganization or where, you know, how that affects the brain development in utero uh, or alcohol exposure, not just lead, but like, you know, so you can do exposure studies. And so through, through my career, I've actually seen people of vast repertoire of backgrounds who have ended up in neuroscience. Mm -hmm. um, one, actually one of my, one of my colleagues in my master's was a dolphin trainer. He was a dolphin trainer at the zoo and he was so good at animal behavior that they went to him and recruited him to come and do a master's and PhD with that lab because they were focused on animal learning, animal behavior. And so, you know, so I think 
there are two tenants I would say like if you're in an undergrad, um, you know, find research that excites you, that's being done in your university. Go talk to mentors or professors who are working in that field. Learn about what research in their lab would look like. Maybe try to do an honors thesis or a little short-term project in their lab. Tell them, ask them if they'd um, be open to it. I can tell you this, like if when, not if, when students come and talk to faculty and say, I'm really excited about your research, uh, can I shadow your students? Can I shadow you? Can I um, just come and observe what research looks like? 99, I don't know anyone who would turn them away because everybody loves their research, their own research, and they want to share it with the world. And to get students excited about it, that's a privilege. And so, you know, find people and, and, and find the people that you have a good fit with working in the lab. People, you know, some people um, are micromanagers. This is like in any other field, right? Some people are micromanagers and that works great for people who need a lot of instructions. And, uh, you know, some people, I, I usually don't work that well with micromanagers, but I do like to come together and discuss the big picture ideas with the team. So like team settings work really well for me. And so, you know, try it on undergrad, early grad school, master's, first year master's, great time to kind of figure that out. You know, what, what kind of a person do I like to work with? Do I want to work in a huge lab? Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of like a factory setting where they're just like constantly putting out papers and, and, and results, but you might not get that much one-on-one -on -one time with your mentor. Uh, or do I want to work in a small lab? And each one has its like, uh, like ups and downs. Smaller labs usually don't have that much funding. So that might be a little bit of a struggle, but you get immense mentorship from every single person in the lab because everyone is invested in each other's success at the early stage. So there's sometimes huge difference between working with a, a an early career researcher versus a seasoned tenured researcher. And so all of these things are nuances that you can figure out during your undergrad and then, you know, ask them because they'll tell you like, if I wanted to work in your lab, what should I study now? Because it's such a diverse field, you can do computational neuroscience where you never have to step in a lab and you can uh, work with, um, scientists like me, I was an experimental scientist. And so I was out there gathering the data. And then I would have big data sets, and then partner with computational scientists, neuroscientists who had these models that were trying to figure out is this how the brain is working. So they had a prediction, and they thought, okay, I'm going to build a model to mimic the brain. And then they feed real world data into it, like from people like me, and then they look at the output and then compare it to human behavior, animal behavior, and see how well the model matches that. And then they go and optimize it. And so they can now have a better idea of how the brain works. So this is an iterative process. So people work together with like different backgrounds and different like strengths. And um, so follow your passions, um, go to what subjects draw you, excite you, what you see yourself studying. And if, if neuroscience is one of them, again, talk to the kind of research that excites you, researchers that excites you and figure out a way in to that field, use them as mentors and get their guidance and say, you know, if I wanted to work in Alzheimer's, what do I need to study now? Um, and so on. And I think the same goes for professionals as well there are biostaticians statisticians who are like oh i really you know i have this immense skill set to analyze biological data whether it's genetics or whatever and they're like we now want to apply those skills to neuroscience welcome you know neuroscientists love that from what i've seen like we love to to partner with people who bring new skill sets into the research mechanism mm. yeah that is fascinating. Um, there is a re there is a lot of research being done around Alzheimer's. You've mentioned dementia a couple of times in the interview. Yeah. And yeah. 
what I find fascinating recently is, well, I don't know about the rest of the world, but in the UK, there's been an increase in Corsakoff's dementia. And okay, Corsakoff's okay. dementia, for those of you who don't know about it, is alcohol-related. Mm. Therefore, a lot of people are younger mm. are finding themselves with dementia. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, that's a really good... Yes, so absolutely correct. Absolutely great point. And I think the the people forget that dementia is a symptom. It is indeed. It is a symptom. It is not a disease. So dementia can be associated with a lot of biological reasons behind it. And that's why there are so many subtypes. Yes. And that's why it has been so hard to cure. Exactly, exactly that. Yeah, so we're really, you know, uh, so I'm currently at the National Institute on Aging. Uh, I work in the Division of Neuroscience as a program analyst, uh, but I'm a contractor. Um, And uh, we're really, as a team, um, working towards precision medicine. Um, And that's, you know, really trying to, like, treat people for the kind of disease they have Mm -hmm. for the underlying biology of it and not the symptoms Mm -hmm. right so and 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 because like alzheimer's is so multifactorial so like some people have a vascular component that's it and and viewers just to say alzheimer's is a form of dementia so people have alzheimer's dementia is it but it is a form of dementia. So, sorry, go ahead. It is. <laughs> absolutely. No, no, no. Absolutely. Yeah. So it is uh, definitely a form. And, 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 but even that itself, like the biological mechanisms, there's inflammation components, right? So uh, I like to go back to evolution because that's something I think shapes everything. Um, and it's so fascinating, but hard to study because evolution happens over millions of years. But experiments in the lab are happening over days or weeks at most, you know, sometimes years, but that's rare. Um, and so those are epidemiological studies that are not necessarily in a controlled lab setting. Uh, so with um, when when humans first evolved, we were not living as long. And the biggest thing was infectious disease. Mm. So we had to develop really strong immune systems that got us past the reproductive age and not die in infancy, right? And so our immune systems have gotten really, really strong. And what we see with aging is now that we're living so much longer, and part of it is also nutrition, don't get me wrong, there's studies that show that high fat diets are really um, exacerbating inflammatory uh, preconditions and all of that. But, you know, over the last few years, we're seeing an increase in things like lupus and autoimmune disorders. And that's when your immune system recognizes your own body as an invader and starts attacking it. Yes. You know, parts of it or celiac and all of these are autoimmune disorders. And in Alzheimer's, there is a big immune component. And so what happens is with Alzheimer's, you have these deposits of abnormal proteins in your brain. And there can be many reasons for that. Maybe you're not sleeping well. So sleep, sleep is a big cause for Alzheimer's as well. Because when we're sleeping, our brains get cleaned out. So all the debris gets thrown out into the uh, cerebrospinal fluid, and then that goes into the blood, and it goes out through your urine. And so if you're not getting full night's sleep consistently in your midlife, then those it's like debris starts accumulating in your brain. Okay, so now that's happening. And there's other reasons to exercise and all of that has similar like, you know, things that can affect your risk for a, a complex disease like Alzheimer's. And then what happens is there's all this debris now. So your immune system goes, okay, that doesn't belong there. So let me start cleaning it out. So then your immune system in your brain kind of wakes up and starts clearing out this debris. 
But then Alzheimer's is happening over decades. People mm -hmm. sometimes live with this, uh, disease, and it's pre-symptomatic for even longer. And so your immune system is in your brain, in your body, it's constantly switched on. And sometimes it starts killing cells. You know, and so there's a big immune component to it that we're just starting to unravel now. And the immune component is variable between people. It's variable between gender. There's a big, you know, women are, are usually have worse dementia, but they live longer with it. So there's simultaneously a larger risk and a larger resiliency. And so, yeah, I think it's... Um, it's a very complex uh, situation and, and yeah, dementia is a symptom and we're, we're really trying to, as a field, move towards a precision uh, therapy approach where, you know, we treat people for the kind of dementia they have based on biomarkers. Yes. Oh, that's, um, that's really good to hear as well. Yeah. Because it is complex at this stage and there's so yeah. much we don't know, I believe. There's so much we don't know. Um, yeah. and it does affect everybody differently. So, yeah. Oh, fascinating. I mean, I, I have to say, I could talk to you for hours, but, <laughs> um, but I, I'm I feel the same way. Our listeners, you've, you've really given our listeners so much to take away today and, and think about. Mm -hmm. And I know that people have found it very, very useful. So, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. That's been fascinating to learn more about what you do, what drew yep. you to it, and how what you're doing now. And yep. your book, I know, is fantastic. I'll be looking for the next one as well. And it has been such a pleasure chatting with you. And as you say, I can speak with you uh, for the next two hours and, and, and still be going because you're you're such a such a wonderful host, and uh, really, it's uh, you know I'm I'm not someone who's I'm I'm an academic. I'm not someone who's like um, doing this a lot and 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 doing podcasts and and things like that. So it's it's such a a, a privilege for me to meet someone like you who's who's doing this wonderful public service. Um, and and just you know educating the public and and thank you for what you do. Thank you as well because you know it's a privilege for me to speak to a doctor about your work that you're obviously passionate, so passionate about, and you're obviously doing the work you're meant to do. So thank you. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's obvious there. So the book will be in the show notes guys go and get it it's on amazon i've looked it's everywhere uh you can also go to jai's website as well so that will be and follow her on on her socials too that will be great thank you so much jai it's been wonderful you must please come back as well i'd love to talk to you about other things too all things absolutely so thank you i would be honored and thank you for the opportunity and thank you Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure you subscribe and follow on all streaming platforms. Leave me a comment and also let me know if there's any particular topics you'd like me to discuss. See you next time.